My brothers and sisters, I want you to realize, and I hope that we can recognize, that we are living in a very, very critical time of Earth's history. The stage is being prepared, and we are seeing what can very easily be defined as another world war that is taking place. The conflict is reverberating around the world and the influence is extending to other nations. We don't know how soon this tide will engulf everyone. We don't know when, but we know it is coming. One thing that we do know, and one thing that should concern us, is that there is a connection between what we see in the world and what God's people must be doing at the same time. We have a work and we have a mission. We have a solemn responsibility. And something else that we're aware of that we're not being really told is that the U.S. is in this conflict. When you look at Revelation 13 and 17, listen, this nation is going to be involved in just about everything that's happening in this world. And we ought not to be surprised. We're going to see that in just a few minutes. We will see that. But let me read to you something here that we were warned of. Over 100 years ago, we were warned. And it says, we are coming to a crisis. Listen, my brothers and sisters, that crisis is not yet to come. That crisis is here. We're seeing the, the stages. We're seeing the beginning of this crisis. And what about this crisis? It's a crisis more than any previous time since the beginning of the world began. So yes, the crisis is coming, but notice what else must take place. It says, continues, will demand the entire consecration of everyone who has named the name of Christ. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Listen, you cannot separate what is taking place in this world and with the experience that God's people must develop to prepare for this crisis. They're linked together. You cannot deny that what happens in the world reflects what God's people must do to respond to this situation. Now, we underline the word demand. This crisis demands. What does that word demand mean? Well, it's kind of like a command, but it's not a command. A demand is an ultimatum. It's like this is the last opportunity you have. This is the last call. And if it's rejected, if you reject the final proposition that God is extending to you to get ready to consecrate your life, there will be consequences. And you know, there's a reason why we have to highlight that word demand, that ultimatum, that final invitation, because it's God who's giving it to us. It's God who requires it. And unfortunately, in many sermons that we hear today, there are no demands being made on anyone. No calls to sacrifice. No calls to bear a cross, to deny yourself, to get ready. You don't have to do anything. Continue just the way you are. Unfortunately, many of the messages that we hear, I'm not talking about this church, throughout the world, there's no urgency. There's no urgency. And there's no call to see what's happening in our world and to emphasize that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We must have that experience. All things must pass away. Listen, all the things of this earth are going to pass away. All the things that we see, it will, it's coming to an end. All things will pass away, we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 
Behold, all things become new. Listen, not just a new earth, a new heavens. We better have that new experience that the Bible calls regeneration. What kind of consecration? An entire consecration. Brothers and sisters, what in our life have we not given up to God? Entire means everything, right? God wants everything. Did, did he not give everything? Is that not the example when he gave his son? He gave everything he had. He gave an entire consecration of him to save our souls. And that's the example. What in our life have we not given up? Have we not yielded? You know, there's a song that says, I surrender all. Do we have to sing the song, my brothers? Do we have to sing that? We have to give an entire surrender, an uh, entire consecration. Listen, anything less than that, you're not ready for the coming crisis. You want God to intervene? You want God to reveal himself? You want God to save us in times of trouble? Well, you know, there's something that we had better do. And we had better develop. Anything less than this will not suffice. That's uh, Gospel Workers, page 92. Here's another one. Volume 8 of the Testimonies. We've read these statements. We've known about these statements. A storm is coming. Brother, it's here. It started. And when we're talking about a storm, my brothers and sisters, we're talking about a great world war that will engulf everything. We're going to get there in a second. I'm going to show you some things, but we have to lay a foundation there's no purpose in showing you a crisis if we don't know what God expects of us to do at this very present moment. We have a current present duty to do, to fulfill. Listen to this. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? I don't know, my brothers and sisters. I don't know. There's hope, yes. There's a work of preparation. Yes, we can be ready. We must be ready. She goes on to say, we need not say the perils of the last days are soon to come. You remember when Paul says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Remember that statement? You know the scripture? We cannot say they're coming. They're here. They've been here. Leonis. Why? Already they have come. That was 100 years ago. My brothers and sisters, how much more urgent should the message be to the church to rise and to shine and to live an experience of consecration, devotion, dedication, yes, self-sacrifice. That means doing something that may not be of the best comfort for us for the salvation of souls. Listen, was it not a cross? Was there not some discomfort for Jesus to come to this earth and give his life for us? Did he not experience discomfort? Yes. But was he willing to endure for the sake of seeing souls saved? Yes, my brothers and sisters. So yes, we are there. We are there. And what do we need? Because the perils of the last days are upon us, because the days are here, because the storm is not just coming, it is, it is raging. What do we need? Here's what we're told. We need now the sword of the Lord to cut to the very soul and marrow of fleshly lusts, appetites, and passions. Oh, see, the popular message of the earth, of the world that we hear today, you don't do, have to do anything. That's not what God is doing to prepare. Listen, you don't do anything, and then the big time of trouble such as never was since there's been a nation, when that comes, well, guess what's going to happen to us? If we don't, if we're not in earnest, as uh, we heard in our children's story, if we're not praying about this situation, I'm not, saying, I'm not telling you to, to, to worry about this situation. Pray about it. 
We're told what we need. We need the sanctifying truth of God's word to do what? To cut to the soul. You know, like John the Baptist says, now the ax has been laid to the root of the problem. Therefore, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. What was that message all about? He was trying to prepare them for Jesus. What are we trying to do? We're trying to help people prepare for the great second coming of the Lord. How much more urgent should there be a work to cut what? The fleshly lusts. That's the only way that we can prepare. That is what we need today because the storm is not coming. It's not coming. We're going to see it's here, my brothers and sisters. It's here. Now, let's look at some Bible. We're told in uh, Galatians 2.20, this is not a new subject. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that a good life to live, this life right here? Crucified with Christ. Is that a good life to live? My brothers, that's the only life that the faithful believers, the disciples of Christ must live. If we don't have this experience, my brothers, do we really know what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ? If we don't have that. See, the gospel is not just a story. And listen, it's not a video, okay? The gospel is not a movie. You watch a movie, that's not the experience that God wants you to have. This is what he wants you to have. The everlasting gospel is something you have to experience in your life. It has to be real. Something has to happen. Yes, Jesus died and was crucified. But guess what? We have to be crucified with Christ. We have to experience this in our lives. And we read, we read, we already read. It says, we need the sword of the Lord to cut to the very soul and marrow of fleshly lust, appetite, and passions. That's what needs to be crucified. That's what needs, what is crucifixion? That means it's the end of something. Crucifixion means death. That's a death penalty. A death for what? Well, let's look at uh, Galatians 5, 17. There on the screen. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. Therein lies the problem. That's why something has to be crucified. That's why something has to be cut off. Something has to come to an end because the flesh is in a constant state of war against the Spirit of God. And the Spirit against the flesh, we read in Galatians 5, 17, And these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that ye would. You want to know why we're not having more of God's power in our life? You want to know why the spirit is is waning? You want to know why the latter rain hasn't come? Because the latter rain, the Holy Spirit is at war against the flesh. They're contrary to one another. It's an irrepressible conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And someone has to go. You can't have them both working and operating and functioning in your life. One of them has to go. One of them has to be suppressed. We either quench and crucify the flesh or we quench the Holy Spirit of God. One of those two have to, can't, they both can't live within me. Either the Spirit of God is going to live in me or my fleshly lust will reign supreme in my mortal bodies and I will never be able to do what God wants me to do. Why can't we get people to come to do evangelism? Why can't we get people to come do missionary work? Why can't we get people to come to church? There's a conflict. There's a war. The works of the flesh are many. Listen, look at the world. Look at the news. 
Look at the division. Look at the, the spirit of war and hatred. The works of the flesh are many and they're manifested in this day and age. And those sins will shut you out of the kingdom of God. Just as surely as it's going to shut the world out of God's kingdom. So we are in a predicament. Uh, let, let, me, let me show you this. We are in a conflict. We are in a war. And listen, yes, the war is over there in Gaza and it's in Russia. Yes, the war is in the Middle East. But guess what? It's here also. There's a war over your soul that is taking place right now. You were born in a battlefield. So we are either going to live for the spirit or for the flesh. You can't have it both ways. You cannot serve God in Baal. You ever hear that Bible verse? You can't serve God in Baal. You ever heard that one? Well, Andy, that's the Old Testament. That's. Well, how about this one? No man can serve two masters. Who said that one? Jesus. You can't serve. You can't, you can't sit on the fence. You know, the latest in condition, they just want to sit on the fence. They won't make a decision for God or for the, the world. They can't make up their mind. And then how about this one? Choose you this day whom you will serve. God or the fleshly appetites, the sinful desires, the passions and the things that we love. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you what God's people are going to do in this conflict. Let me show you right here. Galatians 5, 24, the last part. Here's what the church of Jesus, here's what the faithful, the disciples of Jesus are going to do. It says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Praise the Lord. They've made a decision. God's going to have a people in the last days who will reflect his character to the world. Not just, not just with words, you know, preaching the gospel with words. But their life is also going to testify that they have an experience before the potentate of the universe, before the king of kings. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. See, when we are in Christ, it's no longer you, my brothers and sisters. When Christ reigns supreme in here, in this temple, it's not your fleshly appetites that are going to live and breathe. No, those things have been crucified. Is that good news, my brothers? Is that good news? Yes, that's the best news we can ever have. Because if we, if, we go, if we take up our cross, if we follow him, you know, if we endure because of this, this conflict between good and evil, if we endure, we will also glory with him when he comes in the clouds of heaven. We all have sinful desires. Listen, every single one of them has them. But we have a choice to make. We have a choice who we're going to serve. We have a choice in who we're going to allow to reign in our lives. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15, 31, the Apostle Paul gives his testimony. Listen, he gave this testimony after he became a Christian, after he was writing letters. You know, he wrote more than any other author of Scripture. After he, you know, he traveled more places than any other missionary, at least up, to, up until his time. And, you know, he wasn't just a prophet who saw, you know, you read Second Thessalonians. He saw the end. He saw the coming of Jesus. He saw, he saw this age of wickedness 
He saw the man of sin. He saw everything. God revealed it to him. But, you know, it seems to me that he was taken to the third heavens, right? You read that? He was taken to the third heavens. He saw things that's unlawful for us to see. He had a connection, a relationship with Christ. And guess what? Even after he did those things, his testimony says, I die. How often? Every day. Every day. He chose to allow Christ to live and reign in him every day. My brothers, can we, can we not say that? How about us? How about us who's gonna, who are supposed to face the great time of trouble such as never was? How about that, those people? What, what do you think they must go through? How do you think they have to live? My brothers and sisters, what we're seeing here is a call to the church of Christ for a renewed consecration of our hearts and our lives. That's what we see here. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. You ever read that? Yes, we have to prepare. Christ emphasized his preparation. He preached his preparation. He's the one who's calling for this work of preparation. When he says, be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the son of man cometh. Be ready. When? At every moment of our life. Preparation to meet God. The readiness for the second of the coming of Christ involves cleansing. It involves the cleansing of heart, a consecration to life. It also involves a putting away of sin. We read in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20 and 21, it says, but the wicked are like the troubled sea. My brothers, is that not a accurate description of what we see taking place in this very generation? Is, is that the kind of life? Is that a life worth living? No, it's not. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. No, there's no rest. There's no, there's no utopia coming, not in this life. Not as long as the devil is alive, there's no rest, there's no peace. It says, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, there is no peace says my God for the wicked. Listen, peace is not found in transgression. Peace is not found in the mystery of iniquity. Peace is not found in the man of sin who's trying to bring peace to the whole world right now as we speak. No, you can't find peace when you're in complete rebellion to the clear teachings of God because the works of the flesh are contrary to the Spirit of God. It's an irrepressible conflict. The works of the flesh are many. And the peace and the love and the joy comes when the flesh has been crucified in our lives. Then we'll have peace. With, read Romans 5 verse 1. Until you have this experience, you will not be at peace with your creator. In fact, our scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 119, 165, we read in our scripture reading, great peace. What kind of peace? Great peace. Well, what about great peace? Have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Can you imagine it? Is that someone who's ready for the time of trouble? Yes. Jesus says in the last days, many shall be offended. Not this group of people. Not those who love the law. Listen, why does it say those who love the law? Why the law? Why does it say those who love? Why doesn't Isaiah 119, 165 say those who love God? Because the whole, the whole world says they love God. The devils believe in God. But they don't love his law. They don't love his word. And we're told, listen, we're told in Romans 13, verse 9 and 10, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. 
It is briefly comprehended in saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of his law. That's why it says law. Because when you, God didn't leave it up to you to define what love is. No, and it's not sentimentalism. Whatever the world calls love, it's not working out. What God defines as love, it means that we're going to treat each other with respect and dignity. That's what love means. So you're not going to steal and you're not going to cheat and you're not going to lie and you're not going to do all these other things. Don't confuse sentimentalism with a, a, an experience that controls the way I act around each of you. It's God who restrains and controls and subdues and cast out that sinful, carnal, unconverted man and women that wants to live inside of us. It's God who, God's grace who subdues those things. When we bring our lives into harmony with the purposes of God, we will have more peace than this world can ever comprehend. Yes, and the world's being torn apart, but we got peace. Yes, it's all come. Yes, but inside we have peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. That is a promise in God's word. Now, listen to this. This came out November 9. We're about to close. November 9, militarytimes.com. It says the number of U.S. troops injured in drone attacks jumps to 56. Listen, let me ask you this. When will this administration, when will the mainstream media, when the pe will the people realize that the U.S. is already in this war? We're already in this. It says here, what happened in November 9? Since drone attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria began escalating in mid-October, the Pentagon, this, this is what the Pentagon reports. I'm going to show you what the Pentagon says next. The Pentagon has reported that a total of 56 injuries, a spokesman announced. Notice, between October 17 and November 9. Listen, that's not even a month. What happened in less than one month? What has happened in this nation? While men are sleeping, what has happened in this world? U.S. and coalition forces have been attacked how many times? How many times? 46 times in less than one month. We've been attacked 46 times. Our U.S. forces. Let me tell you, when someone attacks your troops 46 times in less than a month, what does that mean? We are at war. That's what it means. But we have people in our, we have people in, let's just say we have people in Washington, D.C., okay? Let's just say that. We have people over there that will not admit and they will not say, we are at war, my brothers and sisters. We are. We're headed into, maybe, maybe it's because it's an election year, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. But the media is not telling us the truth either. Even though our U.S. troops have come under fire 46 times in Syria and Iraq. Now, what does is, what is our nation say? What does the Pentagon say? Here's what the Pentagon published. This is also November 9. It says, U.S. strikes enemy weapon storage facility in Syria. So what we did is, what do you do? Well... We got hit 46 times in the U.S., I think, two times. We responded two times. And uh, this, last, this last week, we're told that the U.S. military forces conducted a self-defense strike November 8 on a facility in eastern Syria used by Iran's Islamic Repo Revolutionary Guard Corps and affiliated groups. You know that affiliated groups? That's a lot more than just Iran. This strike was conducted by two F-15 aircraft against a weapons storage depot. 
said Secretary of Defense. Now, what happened? Notice this. This precision self-defense strike is a response to a series of attacks. They recognize. They're saying, yes, we've been attacked, and we're responding. We're responding. And, and where's the image? There's, there's the, the weapons depot. So my brothers and sisters, listen to this. Notice what has been happening in this earth. You know, we've seen what happened. We see what happens in Ukraine. We see what's happening in Israel and Gaza. And not long after that, not long after that, these, this so-called, let's get the language right. The so-called Iran, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard and affiliated groups. That group right there. That's what the, the Defense Department names. That group. They've attacked the U.S. more than two dozen times. And we've conducted an airstrike against their, their, I guess, where they store all their weapons. Thinking, hoping, well, that, that's going to teach them a lesson. My brothers, needless to say, the attacks will continue. We don't want it to continue. But let me tell you, you can't restrain your carnal, sinful human nature. Only God can restrain those things when he comes in our life. Flesh cannot be restrained. Listen, you can't control Satan. Can you control him? Could they control him in heaven? No, he couldn't be controlled. He had to be cast out. And when Satan was cast out, then peace was restored in heaven. And until Jesus comes again and casts him out again, there'll never be peace. And so the U.S. sent two F-15 fighters. They announced it. They published it. They shared the video as a deterrent to everyone else. But needless to say, these attacks will continue. And once again, the U.S. will be forced to hit back again and again and again. My brothers, that's what war looks like. That's what it is. And meanwhile, Gaza hasn't gotten any better. The Ukraine hasn't gotten any better. And we are already deeply involved in this war. We're involved. Most Americans have no idea. We close with this. Open your Bibles to the book of Mark. Matthew 13, we close with this. Matthew 13, verse 41. When's it all going to come to an end? Notice Mark, Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. It says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Those who refuse the merciful invitation of Jesus to live a life. Those who are in Christ, all things have become new. Those who refuse that invitation. We're told in the Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew 13, 41, God's going to take all these elements, all the warring elements, all the works of the flesh in this earth. All those elements, he's going to gather them together. Now, listen, I didn't write the Bible. Praise the Lord. I didn't write verse 42. I didn't write it. I'm just going to read it. Verse 42 says, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Listen, the former things are going to pass away. Behold, he who sits on the throne says, I make all things new. No more pain, no more misery, no more death. Praise the Lord for that. But what about those who want to hold on to those things? Listen, unfortunately, we either allow God to make things new in our life now by allowing him to come in. And what's going to happen with the, with the warring things in our life, the flesh, the passions, the lust? He's going to crucify those things. 
and the life that we live, we now live by faith in the Son of God. It's a new life. And if we have that, my brothers, we're ready for the kingdom of God. A kingdom where dwells peace, righteousness. A, ki a kingdom where nothing shall offend. Sin shall not rise up again. But all those who want to hold on to this world and the things of this world, unfortunately, they've made their choice. They'll be cast into the lake. Well, it says a furnace of fire. Listen, every root of bitterness, every sorrow and cause of sorrow, Everything that has brought oppression, everything that brings strife, everything that brings division, the things that cause pain and tears, all those things will be eliminated and removed and purified. That's why it says in verse 43, then shall the righteous shine, then there'll be peace. 43 of Matthew 13, then shall the righteous shine forth like the sun, Oh, my brothers, it's then that the faithful will be able to enter into a kingdom where nothing will offend. No war, no conflicts, no divisions. Brothers and sisters of sin, the era of sin and lawlessness and rebellion will soon be finished. Praise the Lord for that, right? It's soon going to be finished. God is ready to put an end to all these things. It re God repented in the days of the flood. He repented that he had made man because they were not fulfilling the reason for their existence. And once again, we're there. We're not fulfilling the reason why God created us as a human race. We're supposed to be an extension of the kingdom of God. We're, the church on earth is supposed to be one with the church in heaven. So my brothers, I just want to close by asking you, how many of you realize today what is happening? Do we realize momentous events are taking place before our eyes? And when are we as Adventists going to wake up and realize how close we are? Or are we just too busy? Are you too busy? Is your schedule so busy? Or are you too much at ease? Listen, religious liberty, praise the Lord for, praise the Lord for our veterans. Because of them, we have religious liberty. Well, praise God. For the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Religious liberty is being dangerously violated. We have a work to do. We have a message to give. And God's people must be found ready. And when we're ready, then we can be working. You, see, you can't work if you're not ready. And if we're not ready, how are we ever going to finish the work God has given us to do? But praise the Lord, listen, we have faithful people. Praise the Lord. We have faithful workers. Yes, we have faithful ministers. Yes, we have those who refuse, who refuse to accept the status quo or be part of the, the mainstream. You know, we, we're going to swim against the stream, not with the stream. That's what mainstream comes from. We're just all going along to get along. No, there's some who actually swim against the current. And praise the Lord for those who go against the grain, who refuse to be satisfied with this present condition. May God help us. Listen, I close with this review and herald, March 22, 1892. Satan is ever ready to fill the minds with theories and calculations that will divert men from present truth. Satan has a multitude of temptations. A multitude of things to distract you from what God has called us to be. May God help us to say no and to refuse to be drawn away from the sacred calling he's given to us as a people. May God help us to be faithful. May God help us to lift the principles of his kingdom upon which are written the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God help us and God bless each of you.